This is the story of Joe Bonanno. Joseph Bonanno was born on January 18, 1905, in Castellamare del Golfo, Sicily, the same area that spawned the Genovese crime family, Joe Masseria, and the Cosa Nostra boss Salvatore Maranzano. Although the Bonannos left Sicily for the United States while Joe Bonanno was a young child, they only spent about 10 years in Brooklyn before returning to Italy. It was Mussolini's crackdown on organized crime that motivated Bonanno to return to America without a visa in 1924. With prohibition providing opportunities for up-and-comers of all stripes, Bonanno joined the Maranzano crew when he was just 19 years old. He stood out early on because, in contrast to his criminal colleagues, he was a well-read man. He rose in the ranks of the Maranzano family, and when war broke out between powerful mob families just a few years after his arrival in the US, Bonanno took advantage of the disorder to establish himself as a true leader. According to former New York Police Department detective Ralph Salerno, Bonanno was one of the people present at the creation of the whole thing, the American Mafia. The Castellamarese War was a year-long power struggle for dominance of the Italian-American Mafia in the early 1930s. The two warring factions were led by Joe, the boss, Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano, Joe Bonanno's fellow countryman from Sicily. Bonanno had been hired as Maranzano's enforcer, protecting his distilleries and doling out punishment wherever needed. He called Prohibition, the Golden Goose, and considered his time under Maranzano as an apprenticeship. The fight was between the old guard and the young bloods. The old-timers held to traditional views of old-world organized crime, including strict fealty to more senior dons and the prohibition against doing business with non-Italians. This was what Masseria was protecting. He had notable mob figures like Lucky Luciano, Vito Genovese, Joe Adonis, Carlo Gambino, Albert Anastasia and Frank Costello. The other side saw younger up-and-coming crews like Maranzanos, who looked to the future. They didn't care what nationality a promising business partner held, and they felt it unwarranted to pay fealty simply for seniority's sake. After a year of bloody deaths, men like Luciano and Genovese grew tired of the war and its effect on business. They reached out to Maranzano and struck a deal, Luciano would kill Masseria, and Maranzano would end the war. Masseria was fatally shot while eating dinner at Coney Island's Nuva Villa Tomorrow restaurant, on April 15, 1931. Nobody was convicted, nobody saw a thing, and Luciano had a rock-solid alibi. The war was over. With the war won, Maranzano reorganized the Italian-American mob. The five families of New York were to be headed by Luciano, Joseph Profasi, Thomas Gagliano, Vincent Mangono, and Maranzano. All would owe tribute to Maranzano, who was now boss of all bosses. Maranzano's reign didn't last long, however, as he was shot and stabbed to death in his office on September 10, 1931. This is when Joe Bonanno inherited his boss's stake and became one of the youngest leaders of a crime family at the age of 26. Luciano assumed control of the newly organized mafia, but he decided to keep Maranzano's blueprint intact. He aimed to regulate the modern mafia like a corporation, calling it, the Commission. This council allowed family bosses to discuss affairs and vote on disputes before they turned into violence. He allowed all nationalities to participate, as long as they raked in profit. According to Bonanno, this led to decades of semi-peaceful organized crime. The Bonanno crime family was small but effective. With Frank Garofalo and John Bonventer as underbosses, Bonanno's faction ran the gamut from loan sharking and bookmaking, to numbers running, prostitution, and real estate. Since Joe Bonanno's secretive 1924 entry into the US made him an undocumented immigrant, he left the country in 1938 in order to re-enter legally and apply for citizenship. It was granted years later in 1945. To his credit, Bonanno was never convicted, charged, or arrested, not even once, during his criminal career. Even during the Appalachian meeting of 1957, a summit of the American Mafia where issues like drug trafficking were discussed, he avoided being arrested by the FBI. It was a failed hit that led to real trouble for Bonanno. When his friend Joe Profasi died in 1962, the Profasi crime family was handed over to Joe Magliocco. Amidst the instability, Tommy Lucchese and Carlo Gambino formed an alliance, which led Bonanno to meet with Magliocco to plan their murders. His ultimate plan was to take over the commission. Joe Colombo was hired for the hit, but instead, he told his targets that Magliocco had sent him. 
they knew that Magliocco wasn't working alone and identified Bonanno as his partner. When the commission demanded that the two be questioned, Bonanno didn't show up. At the same time, Bonanno was subpoenaed to testify before a grand jury investigating organized crime. Faced with two uncomfortable appointments on either side of the law, Bonanno fled and went into hiding in October 1964. Leaderless, control of the Bonanno crime family was handed over to Gaspar de Gregorio. When Joe Bonanno resurfaced in May 1966, he claimed to have been kidnapped by the Buffalo crime family's Peter and Antonio Magadino, which was almost certainly a lie. He was then indicted for his failure to appear before a grand jury, but he challenged the indictment for five years until its dismissal in 1971. With the Bonanno family split apart, with Di Gregorio loyalists on one side and faithful Bonanno devotees on the other, Bonanno struggled to rally a crew that was as tight as it once was. Nonetheless, he tried, with violence erupting at a sit-down in Brooklyn in 1966. Nobody died at that meeting, but the warring continued, and then Bonanno did the unthinkable. He announced his retirement in 1968. This usually doesn't go over well. But with Bonanno's status as a former boss and his promise never to involve himself in the Mafia again, the commission accepted his terms. They stipulated, however, that should he break them he would be killed on sight. Joseph Bonanno was convicted for the first time in his life at the age of 75 in 1980. Charged with conspiracy to obstruct justice, a jury found him guilty of attempting to block a grand jury investigation into alleged money laundering through companies owned by his sons. He spent a year in prison for the crime. Then, in 1983, Joe Bonanno did the unthinkable once more, and released an autobiography about his time in the Mafia. Although Bonanno's literary career violated the Mafia's code of secrecy, perhaps more flagrant to the mob was Bonanno's appearance on 60 Minutes with Mike Wallace in April 1983. By then, however, he was a civilian, and his work was out in the open for all to see. In 1985, during a New York racketeering trial against leaders of the five families, the then U.S. attorney in Manhattan, Rudy Giuliani, pressed Bonanno about statements he had made about the existence of the commission. However, he told the government nothing during the trial. He was imprisoned again for 14 months for refusing to testify. Joe Bonanno passed away from heart failure on May 11, 2002, leaving behind one hell of a story of the rise of the American Mafia.